So when I first got in the league, when I was in Denver, we had all these. DJ Williams used to be on the show. He was the one passing around the uh, Vialysis. The Cialis and the Vi Cialis. That's different. Whatever it's called. No, no, Cialis, we're Vialis, about Vi But yeah, but oh, we was doing, we wasn't doing Viagra. Was still so what happens is they was passing them out before the game. We was taking them because when you when it, it thins out your blood, thins out your blood, energy, and you go longer. I'm not talking about Cialis and I'm talking about actual surgery. Oh, what you saying? Yeah, like like enlargement. Yeah, surgery. that's what I'm talking about. Enlargement. People be really People doing, be that. doing that. Yes. I ain't never. I ain't know no. I don't know no. No, no. See, y'all, 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 y'all. No, no. Yeah, hey, listen, listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all talking about something that's gonna keep it right for 36 hours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, now, yeah. Now this motherfucker taking that. Shit, they can be that way forever. Oh my god. <laughs> In, yes. the, in the league? That's how you get suspended. In the NBA? That's how you get suspended. People do that in the NBA? People, I'm sure people do that six, across seven, the Y'all 6'7", 6'8", I thought like... <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Is that a pause? <laughs> That's a major pause. <laughs> We had to fight to get a meal, yeah, wrongfully accused We had to fight to get a pill, that's why we right to get a deal He on the team, he gotta eat, you know, despite the skills Keep it riding for the fam, you gotta light the wooden wheel straight up But in the past bad, work up in the trash bag I'll pass a lot to take the test before I pass class, yeah And my family needed bread, I had to come correct That's why I keep airing it out like I just passed gas Athletes are some of the healthiest people on the planet. Adopt a lifestyle with an all-new HOA Plus app. What's up, athletes? It's your girl, Maya HOA here. Plus delivers Welcome daily to workout classes with real coaches tailored squat. just for you. We are making it easier to train, fuel, and recover where you are. You made it. Live like an athlete. Join the try on HOA Plus. Disruption, fearless, bold, unapologetic, us, real. There's so many adjectives that, that defines I am athlete. Really appreciate everyone rocking with us. Super excited about season four. We got Paper Route launching with Ashley Nicole Moss. Uh, be myself, Adam Pac-Man Jones, Shady McCoy, and so many other contributors. You know, what I'm super excited about is Tuesday, you guys being able to chime in. Y'all got so much shit to say. Call us. We live every Monday through Friday, 7 to 9, on SiriusXM, Pandora, and Stitcher. And you can also listen to any of our shows wherever you get your uh, podcast. Uh, so super excited about this. Ashley Nicole Moss, you guys seen her introduction um, I don't even know if I need to intro her again, but I think about just bold, and I'll say this probably show after show after show, bold, uh, obviously beautiful, but the biggest thing is brilliant. And I'm so excited uh, for her to be sitting alongside of us and partnering with us. She could have been anywhere else, but she chose us. Uh, but she's gonna change the conversation. Uh, Adam Pacman Jones, and I'm gonna continue to say this, real, in the realest, one of the realest I've ever been around. Um, this dude right here was misunderstood. People didn't understand him back in the day, but now in this whole new environment, when we talk about new media and we talk about us being unapologetic about who we are and where we come from, I mean, he was ahead of his time, right? This was a guy that was fine for being himself. This was a guy that was suspended for being himself, and now it's celebrated. So Adam Pack, man, Jones is the man, um, and then, LaShawn Shady McCoy, he's not here with us. He missed his flight. <laughs> <laughs> but we love you. Shady, fearless, you know, a lot of swagger. He's suave, he's savvy, super smart. Don't get it twisted, super, super smart. And then the new wrinkle, Chef Danny. Chef Danny, we love you. Um, thank you so much for coming on and being our resident chef. So guys, this episode uh, is the first episode of season four. This was a big deal for us. We literally spent an entire month trying to find the right person just to jump off this season. So this person right here, you know, the adjective that I would give, Pac, is disruptor. Mm. Um, I would get, the adjective I would give, I would say activist. Mm. 
powerful one. I'm gonna go unapologetic. You know that's my favorite word. Mm. You know I love an unapologetic person, podcast, space. And that's who we have today, Steven Jackson, everybody. Stop, yes. stop, as the homies like to Thank call him. What's you. up, what's up? Thank you Man. so much for joining us. This is so cool. Honored to be here, long overdue. Y'all family, you know, we go back, so it's only right that I be here. Mm. So my word was Look on a, fly. No, super, super fly. fresh. I, well, I knew I was coming on this show. <laughs> Trust me, y'all three and Shady. I know I know how y'all be on this show. <laughs> Come on now. I, I had to make sure I was I was dressed to par. Who dressed you? Me. I don't have a stylist. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Brandon. I don't even know what that is. Who dressed you? Who dressed you, Brandon? <laughs> me, but listen, JoJo. Huh? You know, I'm always trying to use our platform to put people on. Facts. We have JoJo that came in re- work in front of house. She came and she had a vision for herself. She said, look, I want to be a stylist. I want to get into fashion. I said, all right, when we do season four, maybe you can help me put it together. So, That's hard. JoJo. Shout out JoJo. Shout, Shout out, out JoJo. JoJo. I mean, hit go. JoJo up That's now. Right. What about you? I did this myself. Okay. You know, my Amex will tell the story that I have a problem, but that's <laughs> for a different conversation. There's an intervention that needs to happen. But my word was unapologetic. And I use that word because I am somebody who just loves authenticity in people, whether people rock with it or whether they don't. And I think that's what the show represents. I think we all represent that in some way, shape, or form in different spaces. And no one has done it better than you in your career and also now in your second career as new media. So. Any regrets, I guess, of being so unapologetic over the years? Um, no, no regrets because, I mean, that's the reason why I'm here. Yeah. That's the reason why we all have the same amount of respect because I didn't compromise anything. Uh, I think the first person that showed me that was Allen Ives, especially playing basketball. You don't have to compromise nothing to be who, who, to be who you want to be. And I think that's what we was taught. We was taught and we were lied to that being successful looks this, looks this way. Being wealthy looks this way. If you want to be, if you want to be considered wealthy or rich, you can't wear jewelry. You can't like all this stuff has been lies. When you get older, you start to learn for yourself, right? And it's a lot of things that I've learned for myself that I know that was I was that was lies when I was kids. So I was taught with the attitude to never compromise anything. You love it or leave it. Mm-hmm. And um, God's favor is something you, that's something that you can't buy. I've had God's favor since a youngster. All the situations where. I could be in jail or ruin my life or try to do something stupid. I had God's favor to protect me. So knowing that I had God's favor at a young age, I didn't care what people thought. You was going to love it or leave it. And uh, I was going to let God's favor dictate where it take me. Damn. I love that because you, I mean, obviously in your personal life, but in your career, you, Allen Iverson, and a few others paved the way for this new I- era of NBA <laughs> players to be unapologetically themselves from the way they dress to tattoos to having relationships with the hip hop community and getting them involved in sports. So as you have seen that grow, I mean, one of the names we spoke about earlier in production was John Morant. There's direct correlations of John Morant, Allen Iverson. We see it with a few others. But how is it for somebody who had to go through that the hard way to now see these players being celebrated for that? It's good to see the invo- the I guess the league continue to grow and ex- and expand to be able to accept different things. We paid a lot of dues, right? Mm-hmm. So I was considered a thug for the brawl in uh, Detroit and half of my friends back at a strip club. The but poster boy, I should say. The poster not, not boy, the right? Thug, the poster boy. Poster boy I, for it. You poster boy first, and I was the poster boy the, of the NFL. But I'm, I'm gonna get back into it. But go ahead and finish you, what you were You're exactly saying. right. Yeah. In fact, this is how I always fuck them up. I've never been in a fight in an NBA game with a player. My whole career, not one. Wow. Mm-hmm. Not one. And then that, that shocks people because they think I'm just fighting every week. I was never in a fight in the game. Yeah, I thought but you was a bad boy. No, not, not even close. A little tussle, a little face-to-face confrontation? Never, a little push, never. No? Nothing. Because wow. one thing about it, too, but two things. One, they knew if it, if it got to that point where I was going there, I wasn't going to do it for TV. That's one thing they knew. Two, I just played the game with a certain passion that looked violent. Yeah. That's the way I play. I wanted it to look violent. Right, right, right. Because that's the way I appreciated the game. It changed my life. It got me out the gutter. So I played this game with a violent, with a violent attitude. That's the way I played it. So I wanted to look that way. But as a human being, the way they made me look, it cost me a lot of money. And it's a lot of things that I had to jump in front of that I shouldn't have to. Right. Right. But I don't. I don't regret any of it because, like I said, a lot of the guys today in the league are reaping the benefits of stuff. Some of the stuff we went through. And I can say the same thing on that. Like. I know you as a person. Like we don't had chances to chill, real dialect back, and it, 
I ain't got to put all it. the business no, back it. out there. But, like, I know that. You, you, you act know like you're on that linear Hold television. Hold on, boy. No, no, nothing. Me Tell the story. Um, you know when the first time me and you met? The first time? Let me guess. You don't remember? Let me guess. Magic City? No. Nope. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Let's guess. Uh, I'm going to make you remember. It, it, no, it wasn't. We was in, it was at a, it was a little hole in the wall. At Greenbar, wasn't it? In the A, nah, it was at a, it was a club. At by Greenbar. I don't remember where it was, but was you- Was across your, from Magic Johnson Theater? Your section was right in front of mine, and somebody in your section that got into it with somebody. Oh, yeah. I jumped across. I ain't never met you. I jumped across and was getting ready to fight with you. I remember that. And that's how me and you became friends. Yeah. Hold on. What? Break that was the first that's time. That's how Manny became friends. He was in the club. You was about I, to, you was about I, to... I knew who he was. We both, everybody knew us in Atlanta. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We basically the same person in Atlanta. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Everybody with us. I see him in the club. We know a lot of the same people. Somebody in this section that got into it with somebody that wasn't supposed to be in there. He getting riled up. Me and my, I said, that's Pat. We jumped over there and went to help him. And that's oh, how me and him met. to go help him. And that's how me and him met. To go help him. To go help him. Oh, that's love. Yeah, we, we got some stories. I mean, me and Stack <laughs> went to, uh, I had a, uh, this wasn't two chain, wasn't even two chain. Yeah. It was just one chain? No, he, he was, was one, zero Ta chain. He was Taeen. He was what? Taeen. I'm talking about <laughs> real name. We, uh, what was the name of that club, baby? Right there uh, uh, by Greenbrier Mall. Me and Stack going there, you know. Stack was the poster board before the poster board, so I wasn't really the poster board then. <laughs> I was just the young boy with all the, with, 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 with the lumber. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> with the hood behind him. Yeah, man, and we had nice work. I'm talking about. Tit wasn't even two chain. Like, literally that same duffel night, duffel bag boys. They was duffel bag boys. They was doing the video the night that me and Jack was in it, and pretty much ninety percent of everything we bought was in the video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The cars, all the bottles. Mm -hmm. like, it was a good night. We didn't been in the mud. Yeah, you know, the like oh, we got I want to know. Yeah. I'm about to break it down. Hold on. Okay, we got I'll similar situations. Down, like, he seen his brother die at a young age. My dad got killed right in front of me. Yeah. Um, he had relatives that went to jail. I had my mom who got took away from me for money laundry. Um, we grew up in a toxic situation, which you really don't even know that you're in till you get older and be like, damn, I just seen seven motherfuckers get killed in the last three weeks. But that's normal. Maybe not to you. Yeah. Maybe not to you. But growing up in our way, that, that, that was kind of normal. Come numb and to then it. you go back, you fast forward the, the suspension. All right, he got suspended. I got suspended. Uh, my, 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 my route was a little bit longer because I grew up... Much longer. I grew up idolizing the Allen Irvings, the Stack Fives, the Charles Barkley. And it wasn't really about they play on the court. It was just how they carried themselves as a man. You know what I mean? They demanded respect everywhere they go. And I can go back from story after story, but I'm just trying to give you your flowers, brother, because it's hard, and, and, and it's hard not to go back and flip, you know what I mean? That, that's the biggest thing that I have, that I have to work on because I, you be like, oh, everything's, then you be like, bro, come on, bro, don't play with me, bro. Mm -hmm. like, how do you prevent, I mean, for both of you, how do you prevent, you know, growing up in such, you know, a toxic environment in, in multiple aspects of your life, how do you prevent that as you get older and wiser from becoming normal, becoming the normalcy. Yeah, you can say, oh, seven people die every day, but that's on, that's not a normal way to exist. It's not but like it normal. was at that time. It was for you, but how as you get it, become an adult and a grown man and you have families and you're married and you have businesses, how do you flip that switch to be like, okay, this is not normal and I can't continue to exist thinking it is normal? Well, we're the providers now. Like, we we are the, the parents. Mm -hmm. So I refuse to let my kids grow up grow up the way I grew up. You know what I mean? They already know about average return per year. They know that already at seven years old. They got bank accounts. They, they, they in private school. Like I'm doing everything that they don't, they, I'm doing everything for them so they don't have to worry about that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I ain't gonna lie, it ain't the easiest thing, but yeah. it take work, what you think? I mean, you gonna, it's, it's, it's a part of, I think for me, a lot of people have been talking about this mental health stuff and you know, for me, you if you don't if you don't have mental health with dealing with like you said, seeing our close friends get killed, seeing our family members just die because we can't afford medicine, struggling for food, not going three days without seeing your mama because she working at a refinery damn near twenty four hours. All these things will cause mental health. Seeing people get shot and running right in front of you, all this stuff will cause mental health. But you can't have mental health once you become successful. Mm -hmm. So for me, 
I, I, I can see people saying, yeah, when we're in the bottom, when we're struggling to, to, to get out of it, we're dealing with mental health. I wouldn't dare say I'm dealing with mental health right now. My life is better than better it's ever been, right? And I'm, I'm saying this a couple months removed from burying my little sister and my little brother. You know what I'm saying? But I know where I came from, right? And I, I worked hard to get out of that. So for me, for, so for me, man, it's it just, I always, look, I always look at it as it could always be worse. I got to right? push back on you. I disagree with everything you said, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what this platform is for. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be no I Am Athlete if there wasn't no Matt Barnes and Stack. Thanks All the well, smoke. God was the first that like really disrupted this space because I'm sitting back, we sitting back like, damn, they're really having these type of conversations and on smoking. YouTube and smoking. <laughs> <laughs> but we know what it is, though. I yeah. was shocked when I got to the NFL yeah. and I'm like, damn, that, he? You was around, we was, you was around some of the memes we was having when we first getting started, so you know. Right. But so, so like, you know, look. Accountability is a locker room. I'm gonna come to you and I'm like, bro, like I feel like what you just said is mask and pain. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because the environments that y'all say that y'all come from, and I come from those environments, Ashley, you come from some of those same environments, right? Um, or been around them. We have to, we survive and we don't thrive. Surviving is like, if I show any weakness, I could be dead. If I show any weakness, I could lose my spot. So that's why I say I got to push back and I respect it. But like you are like the top of the food chain. You are lying. You know what I mean? Like the, your mindset, what you're able to overcome is your threshold is so much higher than anybody else's. Right. But some people break in those environments. And, and so that's why I feel like when you do bury your sister, you do bury your brother, your friend and so many others like when do we cry? Mm. When do you sit back and say, I need help? Have you done that? Well, you know what? I've, I've, I haven't got help, but I cry, bro. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I think every show I've been on in the last couple months, I cried on. Just thinking about my brother. I have, I have no problem wearing my emotions on my sleeve or, or, or letting it out. Um, we all have insecurities, but insecure men do that. And I'm not insecure, right? I'm, I'm, I'm very confident with who I am. I, I, I know I'm, I'm very emotional about things I love because I love hard. So I don't, I don't care about showing my emotion in person or in, in any place, right? So that's why I can say that, bro, because I'm me at all times. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I have no problem sitting there talking to y'all about my brother and me breaking down crime because that love was real. That's my best friend since the third, since the third grade. So those type of emotions, if it's real, you can't hold them back, right? And, and that's how I always been. So th that's why I look at like now, it's really nothing, it's really nothing that can happen in my life, bro, that'll make me not wake up every day and show Allah I deserve everything I'm blessed with. And that's what I wake up to do. I, I, I gotta show God everything that he blessed me with that I deserve it because I know I could walk out of here right now, anything can happen where I can lose my life. I know that the guys that's not on the NBA commercials or guys like me who are considered a bad guy don't get the opportunities I'm getting right now. Mm, yeah. You know what I'm saying? After basketball. They don't. It's only the top players, the one that's on the commercials. Right. So I know what position I'm in, bro. Mm. So I'm going to continue to let God's light shine on me and not put myself in position to f this up. Because I shouldn't be here. Hold on. Say that again. That's what I'll be saying. I'm not going to put myself in a position to f it up, bro. Because I know us. Yeah. And I know me. Perfect example at the fight. Everybody want to run and see a fight and see what me and them arguing about, but they're knocking my wife down. Right. I'm 44 years old. The last thing I want to do is pull out my phone and go see a fight. You know what I'm saying? But the protector and provider in me came out. First thing people do, oh, Jack back. No, I wasn't trying to, I'm, I'm protecting my queen. <clears throat> what any one of us was supposed to be doing, right? Okay. So it's, it's a lot of situations that are, that are bring you back and, and that'll make you feel like you haven't, you haven't evolved, bro. Because people always tell me, Jack, there's always that little foot out there. You've grown so much. You've evolved so much. Nobody ever thought you'd be at the position, but it's always one little thing in a way that want to clip you and, and make you lose everything. And that's always going to be out there for everybody, bro. All of us. So I always, I always continue like to, I, 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 move with a, I move a certain way now with knowing that anything can happen at any moment to anybody, bro. Right. None of us exempt. The same person that sleep under a bridge right now that's homeless, <laughs> we can wake up at the same time and the same thing can happen to both of us. And, we in two, and I'm in the mansion and he under the bridge, but the same thing can happen to both of us. COVID. Anything, bro. Your heart, your heart stopped. 
my, my, my little brother's heart just stopped. Three years younger than me, healthy. Just stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? So like, I, I, I live my life with a different appreciation, bro. Excuse me, dog. How do you? I live my life with a different appreciation, dog. Because I know how quick it could be gone. So, so am I missing it? I think it's about finding the balance of, I don't think he's saying to ignore the tough times or ignore your mental health, but I think it's more about not letting those periods of darkness consume your overall blessing. Exactly. And I think that everyone goes, to, I mean, you know, you talk about um, Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan been very vocal about, you know, their depression and their struggles with mental health. And I think that it's not about ignoring that your mental health may not be in the best space. I think it's also seeing it as a bigger picture and saying, but I'm blessed. Yeah, yeah but I can feel this That's because joy. I'm here and well, I can feel this well, because well, I'm here. Well, we know that, right? Like we say this a lot in our community, especially in church, right? Where it's like, you know, there's a difference between uh, being happy and having joy, like having ha happiness and joy. Happiness is uh, conditional. You know, everything's good, so you're happy. Joy is this sh could hit the fan, but I still understand that it could be worse. Right. Like there's joy, like no matter what the condition is, you have joy. Um, the reason why I ask if I'm missing it is because like, you know, I love mindset. I love this. That's stuff. a hard place to get to, though. Like it, it's very hard to when you're in it, when right. you're in that dis despair and you're in that darkness to see the to see the light, to see the blessings. It's not an easy thing to so, do. So, so it, it's, it's, I know this is about you, but let me ask you, you real quick. It, though. I know. I know. But look. Me, Pac, you know I struggle crying. I don't. I let mine out. Salute. I have no problem. Salute. <laughs> My brother, look at you. Yeah. You're just a different dude, boy. I have no problem. That's why I said this boy disrupted. That boy sit up and say, that's, but you know, that's like love. That's respect. Like, he just brought love. Like, you a different dude, boy. I have no problem with showing my feelings, though. I know, but hold on. But, but this, like, listen, I'm trying to get emotional right now. Can I get emotional? A lot of times I want to get messy. Can I get emotional? I'm just saying, like, I struggle crying sometimes. Like, what he's saying, like, I struggle crying. That's why, that's the problem, though. I get help. I'm talking to somebody. I know I love mental health. But, bro, like, it out, bro. right now, I'm, I would say this. I'll be very vulnerable. I'm in one of the toughest times of my life for so many different reasons. You know, being an entrepreneur, startup mindset, we have almost 100 uh, partners, employees that's working with us. It's hard. And I got some personal things going on, so much stuff going on. And, like, there's times I'd be driving and I, like, want to cry. And I won't let myself cry. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you know what I mean? Like, there's times you know, I, there's, I've cried, like, four times over the last three years, but I should have, I felt like I should have cried like a hundred. You know what? I mean, one thing about it, bro, you, you got to learn how to make love to the bad times like you do the good times. Mm. Because that's, that ain't doing nothing but hurting you right. at the end of the day. Because you can, you can be mad at somebody, but, you know, when you forgive somebody, that's not for them. Right. That's for mm. you. Because crying is the same thing. But the reason why I'm not crying, though, Stack, is because of what you're saying, but I won't let myself cry because I look at him like, man, but, like, I see the vision. I see where we're going. You know, I understand there's going to be better days. I've been here before. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I know, like, this just tough, what they say? Tough times don't last, tough people do. Mm -hmm. You understand? So it's mm -hmm. like, but I, I, when, I, when I'm in that moment, my face, just, my face start changing. It just won't come out. And I, I don't know if there's something wrong with me or not. No, it ain't, it ain't nothing wrong. It's just everybody deal with stuff differently, bro. Like, yeah. you, you, you'd probably be the same person as me, but you just deal with it different. Right. And ain't nothing wrong with that. You know what I'm saying? And, and, it's gonna, and I guarantee you, though, it's going to be a moment yeah. where you won't be able to stop that shit. Them tears just going to come down. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's the moment you don't want to let that happen. You know what I'm saying? Because perfect give you an example, dog. My, gran my, grandma, my grandmother um, was with my grandfather almost 50, 60 years. Wow. She never drove a car. Never had a job, right? My whole point when I got to the NBA was to build my mom and my grandmother's house. I did that. My grandfather died my first year in the NBA. My grandmother just stopped eating. 100% healthy. Stopped eating and just sat there because she didn't know life without him. without him. Didn't know how to do nothing. But I'm saying to say, depression and hurt, that shit kill you, bro. And it killed her because she, she just she didn't want to live after that. So some kind of way, bro, and it might not be nobody you talk to, because me, I don't, it ain't nobody I can talk to besides the man upstairs. But it's going to come out, 
It ain't gonna be nobody you talking to. It's just gonna come out at one time. It's gonna be the best feeling you had in your life, bro. Yeah. Because it's, it, you're gonna release a lot of stuff that you're holding on to that have no weight in your life, dog. That don't that don't matter today. Even the stuff you're going through now, it won't matter. Right. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It won't matter down the line. But as as of now, it's thing that you're supposed to go through because this because we are protectors and providers. So we put ourselves in certain positions to go through certain things that everybody not built for. But this is why I wanted to be vulnerable and honest, bro. You know, since 2008, I've been talking about mental health. Yes. And if I'm being honest, you know, we do these check-ins all the time. I feel like if I fucking break right now, there's a whole lot of shit that's going to fucking hit the fan. But that would my be mom, selfish. That would be selfish. My brothers, my if sisters, break, my aunts. That would be selfish on your part. Because look at all the people you got depending on you. Why would you break? That's selfish, B. Right, right, That's right, selfish. right, right, right. And, and, and we, not, we don't have the selfish DNA. Right. You wouldn't be here right now with all the blessings you have. Let me ask you something. Yep. Because I think this is a good conversation, but my question is, how do you heal from, from different events if, if you don't let it out? If you, if you never let it out, how do you move forward? Like, that's a big thing that what, what Stack was saying. Like, at a certain point, you got to let that shit out, B. Yeah. Like, how do you move forward if you don't let it out? Like, it's okay to go in your room and scream and cry and whatever you whatever you want to yeah. do, you know. We call it 15 minutes of physical frustration. No, every, day ain't, every day ain't pieces and cream with your wife. Right. You know, so it might be, hey, you got 15 minutes. God damn it, boom, 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 boom. But we can, once we let that out, I love you, baby. Boom, boom, boom. Right. Because if you, it, I feel like if you don't have a place where you can let that shit out, it just, it, it don't do nothing, but it builds up, builds up. It'll come out and the then wrong way. when it builds That's up right. that That's high. Right. You're a ticking time bomb. Yeah. I think it's harder for some people because I'm a lot like Brandon. I have a very tough time crying. I have a very, I'm, for, especially like you would think women should be more emotional. Thing. No. I, I, I tend to be a lot more cold with my emotions and it's something that I've worked on in therapy for many years is not being afraid to be vulnerable because I associate vulnerability with weakness. And that is something that I personally had to deal with and had to correct because being vulnerable doesn't mean you're weak. And Thank you. I think that it's, it's a programming, whether it's how you grow up, how fast you have to grow up, whether it's bullying in school or wherever the case may be, you associate, well, if I cry, that means I'm just going to get it worse. So if I'm just stoic and I compartmentalize it, it'll go away, but it never really goes away. And I think as you get older, you realize that and to be able to attack those emotions head on and just let it out, like they're saying, I feel like that's a bigger sign of strength right. than what you and I tend to do. Yeah. No, I 100% I agree. Um, when I was, I was at McLean Hospital for three months in an outpatient program, 2011. And every time I would get to the root of something, I would write. So I have like a notebooks of just writings and I still write to this day and um, what I wrote when I finally kind of realized like the core of my struggles um, this is what I put together is like my strength ruins my mind body and soul I've been trapped all my life not by man or cages but by my own emotions where I've been while traveling inside myself can be summed up by one word Damn, right? Like, and what I was, what, what I, what I realized was like, where we come from, that oomph, that survival instincts made me a beast on the field. But that beast on the field, like, was tearing up those interpersonal relationships and everything off the field. So I was like, man, how do you channel that? Like this thing, that emotion, that old, oh, I was literally deemed a beast. Mm. And so, like, when, when I now on the game is over, I got to turn that switch off. You know, how do I then go to a calm dude? Like, I had to go to a, a hospital, a mental health institute, right? Like, I was there for three months, got an apartment, all of that, to learn these things. Dialectical behavior therapy, self-assessment, mentalization therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, one-on-one -on -one with the great Dr. Gunderson. Before I stepped on campus, I did a clinical evaluation, neurological evaluation, just to see what was going on with me, right? So it was, it was, uh, it was life changing for sure. Um, but you know, I had to go through that. But to answer your question, Pac, I feel like right now I'm, you know, it's like stages of life. You know, now I'm an entrepreneur, just retire or cut, cut. I ain't walk away on my terms, cut a couple years ago. 
And now, boom, we launched this company. We got 100 employees. So how do you deal with all of that and all the emotions? So I walk in. Can I show emotions? Can I not? You know, how do I operate, right? And so, like, when you ask that, I talk to somebody once a week. I still have a therapist, Gail. She's been in my life for forever. And then also you. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's how long, been how long you been seeing Gail? <laughs> Are you jealous? Why we finna fight Gail ass? How long? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how long you been how saying that? <laughs> <laughs> we about to get that boy a new, new therapist. Uh, don't no, no, no fire shots at Gail. No, we gonna get that Damn, number bro. Two. I'm just no, asking, bro. It was I a do, joke. I for really a long time. love that how we're long? having this conversation because I feel like it's a direct channel to an interview. You You're an asshole. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. You're an asshole. <laughs> Gail, You're he an didn't asshole. Mean it. Gail, See, he I love it. You don't like where I'm at right now? You're getting better. Hold me accountable. Oh, no, if what? I need to be held accountable, do it. This is, this what, is all the smoking I am at yeah, the collab. Like, my point is, bro, like you just, actually you said it all yourself. Like once we put this shit out, he need to look at this motherfucker and just listen to what he just said. Last time you seen your therapist. I'm struggling right now being on a consistent basis. So like I, I talked to her like uh, a week ago. I talked to her a week ago. Um, we are scheduled weekly, but like, yeah, like a week ago. But I say you too, because you don't you. understand. Like, I don't always need my therapist. That's what I'm trying to say. This is key. He uses right? us. Like, back then, I, I needed need my therapist. Hold on, Pat, hold on. Like, I'll you give know? it to you. I needed my therapist back then. I, first of all, I, I needed McLean Hospital. Then I needed a therapist. And then now I'm able to manage. When, when I call you and you know the conversations we have, and you like, yo, B, that's therapy for me. Yeah. You understand? And you know the conversations that we have. So yeah. like, but damn, like, do, you don't like where I'm at right now? Uh. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, as a friend, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Tell me. But don't give it, up too much. I, you know, I like to be kind of, I like to be um, public, but damn, not no, too. No, no, no. Only thing, as a friend, I would say your communication have to get. Oh, not I, with me. I agree with not that. Not with me because I'm on your ass every day. But I think your your communication got to get better with the group, and that's if I had something to say. Okay. Like, I've you know, always told you communication you is not you your strong suit. You know how to get wrong with me. I've been out to dinner with Brandon, and I'm having a full conversation with him, and he's like this, and I'm, I'm like, working. so I'm like, so how do you feel about that? Huh? Wait. What'd you say? I'm like, I'm not repeating it. <laughs> let's just let's just move past it. Let's just move on. Him and his him and his phone, but I look like I said I like this conversation because you recently on all the smoke, Dejounte Murray, mm -hmm. you had a really just transparent, real, authentic conversation with him, and I loved it because he's not someone who opens up very often, and he has a lot of similarities in his upbringing as you, as Pac, and a lot of other people, and there was a few parts in it that really stood out to me. One was he spoke about the Spurs trying to break him. And I've never been in a locker room from, non, from a non-journalistic standpoint. You guys have been in locker rooms as athletes. Does that happen more often than it, not, than it does not with organizations trying to break problem players that come from the hood or come from the least sexy type of environments or not favorable environments? And that was a dope conversation, by the way. Incredible uh, conversation. Thank you. Incredible. Appreciate it. Uh, shout out to my bro, Matt. Um, only in San Antonio. Really? That's the only place I've been through that. Um, I think they had a way that they did things and, and, you know, Pop was just stuck in his ways with San Antonio. I mean, he knew I'm going to have success as long as Tim's here. Once Tim leave, over. We knew that as players. Um, I just think that he had to put certain guys around him to make the the vision come complete, right? Mm -hmm. So with me, I was in a position where I was raw, you know, still smoking weed, sipping syrup all season, but still balling while I'm doing all that. And I, I, I was a little edgy. Like I didn't, when Pop was trying to he'll take me out the game when I didn't even do nothing to see if I'm gonna blow up on the sideline to try wow. to, I'm not the person for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not, and before I even make it to my seat, I'm gonna let you know. What the fuck is you doing? Right. Why is you taking me out? I ain't do shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm a, that's me. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that didn't sit too well with Pop, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times, so my first year they put me on the engine list. 
Um, you so wasn't injured? I wasn't injured at all. I just didn't play the whole season. <laughs> they put me on injury. I wasn't injured what at was all. What was your bro. injury? Wasn't an injury. So he, he assigned the black coach, Mike Brown at the time. He's the head coach for um, yep. Sacramento Kings now. He assigned him to me. So every time I came out the game, he sent Mike down there. You know what I'm saying? And I had a lot of respect for Mike because that's how I got to San Antonio. So Mike coming, you know, he used to come down there and I'm, I'm looking at Mike and I'm like, Mike, don't come down here. I'm going to go <laughs> off on you. I mean, I'm about to tell him that sometimes. Like, y'all know what you're doing, Mike. But not, to, not today. I'm going to go off on your ass, too. You know what I'm saying? It's been times like that. But he came down there, he'll just stand in front of me. So Pop couldn't hear, I'll read my mouth, I couldn't hear what I'm saying. So he was really looking out for me. So I start trusting him. Bro, I know, you, I know this ain't the type of place for you. You play defense, you get on the court. Once you get on the court, you know what I'm saying, you can put yourself in a position to sign another contract. So I, did, I deal with it, but the whole time, he's trying to make an example out of you. So mm. what, what Pop would do, he would make you play yourself off the team. And he's going to mm. put you in every situation. So I, went, I ended up winning the championship the first time, right? Mm -hmm. I was supposed to get my big contract then, Pac, but they, he didn't want to pay no real one. He wanted to pay Ginobili and Tony Parker. The European guys. He had a certain look for the team. I wasn't in that look, but I was a big reason why we won. He knew that. So they want to offer me three years, 10 million. Get out of here. I ain't taking that one. You finna get Ginobili 70, 80. I'm not taking that. So I bounced, but when I come back, he's still on that same shit. I'm, I'm finna sum the story up. So when I get back the second time, he's still trying to play little mind games with people, and I see that, so I ain't really going for it. Uh, we make it to the Western Conference Finals. I ball out. The next year he come back, he's not playing me at all. Playoffs getting ready to come around. One thing about it, if you cut a, a, a guy at a certain time at the end of the season, he can't go play for another team. Right. So this is what Pop did. So I had a great practice. I wasn't playing as much in the game, so I used practice as my games. And I talked, and I was busting their ass, completely busting their ass. Tim Duncan loved it. He loved every bit of it because that's the type of players he wanted on his team. So coming out of practice, I had a great practice. I'm thinking he's going to play me in the next couple of games because the playoffs going to start. He, tell, uh, he sends somebody to come get me out the, out the, way, out the um, locker room and says, Coach, I want to talk to you. I go in the practice room. He sit me down and show me the, my three worst possessions of the whole season. Not the million good plays I had, but three bad plays that he had to go through tape to find, right? And he showed me those three possessions. He was like, I want you, I'm going to bring the team in. I want you to admit that Danny Green and Ginobili are better than you wow. because I'm going to play them in the playoffs. What? Like verbally wants you to admit Verbally. Wow. This is one of the smartest coaches I've ever played with. Before he even asked me that question, Pat, you know he know how I'm going to respond. Hell no. no uh, that, flip, that's that's my flip, reason to get you out of here, this, I would have flipped the table. But let, me, but let me tell you how you know. B, B yeah, this that, how, that this how you know. Right there. This he is how you it. know he, he, he knew that. So as we having a conversation, Tracy McGrady's landing in San Antonio. <laughs> so he know, he know I'm going to go off. Let me get the f*** out of here. He ain't better than me. He ain't better than me. Oh, y'all, let me get my bread. And I walk out. But he knew that was, he knew that's how I was going to respond. Yeah. And they had Tracy McGrady come in. So he was, he was, he was going to do it regardless. Even if I would have said, you know what, Pop, I can, I'm going to do better. Even if I would have said that, I was still getting cut. You know what I'm saying? But he yeah. knew how I was going to respond. So that's the type of games he played. But he don't play it with his stars. He played it with certain guys that he feel like he can teach to. I'm not that guy. Before, hold on, before we move on, let me bring out Chef, because I want, I want to get Chef's perspective on this. Chef Danny, please come out. And uh, we'll pick up right where we left yeah. off. Chef Danny, but I want to get her perspective. Chef, break oh. bread. Chef Danny, I have those ah. pants. I know how uncomfortable they're to walk in sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> fish, fish. Oh, Chef D. Is that goldfish? No. So y'all need to know the y'all need to know the origin of Chef Danny and where she started. Okay. And I'm gonna let Chef tell the origin. Oh, sh yes. Big Brenda, golden wings, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Chef Danny here. Like I said, season four, we all the way up. We lean into what we believe in. Food is a big part of what we do. Fashion is a big part of what we do. Family, football, ball, all of that. Um, Chef, thank you so much for <laughs> believing you. in us. Um, you're sensation sensational. 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 Let me say that again. You're sensational. Yeah, you get future to say that. Okay. So, um, Chef, tell us a little bit about your origin in these gold wings. <laughs> and then you know, the inspiration behind it. Then we're gonna pick up where we just left off because I wanna get your perspective on that. Okay, so, I mean, I am someone who's definitely down to my roots, like humble beginnings. However, I like some luxury 
So <laughs> I bougie. lived out in, yeah, very, <laughs> very bougie. Um, but I lived out in Dubai for almost two years, pretty much. And I was playing, <laughs> I was playing with gold <laughs> there. Basically, a lot of the people there, they really like some real cool stuff. They like to eat with their eyes. They like a lot of Western foods, but of course they want it up leveled. So golden wings is one of the things that I was playing with there. Um, also the golden steaks before Salt Bay, Salt Bay. Okay. <laughs> way before Salt Bay, it. and I just do want to, I, Salt Bay. If you're looking at this, I told him that he needed to come to the states. Ooh. Yes, so Whoa, and do that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you're right. yeah, right. exactly. So I did tell him that he needed to come to the states because his presentation and the way that he actually was, yeah. So, anyways, bought this to the states and was also cooking that up in the strip clubs. Mm. Oh. Yeah, and pretty oh, much. Oh yeah, everybody buying gold wings. Oh yeah, you already so, know so, that. So, 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 listen. There's so much we can talk about with you. Like when when you just talked about Salt Bay, the first thing I thought the, thought about was diversity, equity, equity and inclusion, right? Like you, it's almost like Fat Joe, and we can get back to that. Terror Squad only athlete to get a freaking TS. Uh, 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 T.S. Chain. chain. No, no lie. As soon as he came in, I looked at that T.S. Chain. I was like, wait a minute, Terror Squad. I know, I know. But that's a whole week. Let's family. get back to that. Let's that's get family. back to that. That's but family. like this diversity, equity, and con inclusion, how should we approach like being real, but also playing the game? So like when we come so much with the flavor and we come so much with who we are, we don't scare the people who may not understand us. Man, scaring them. They stealing all our shit anyway. What you mean? We are the most copy race ever. So why, I mean, why? honestly, if you do look at K-pop's culture and stuff like that, yes, that's honestly taking the whole 90s R&B and yeah. everything that we've done, and they're just pretty much rebranding it. So, like, it, you're, you're absolutely right about that. We are the most copy culture. It's like we do the blueprint. Right. So I feel like introducing that to other people, and when you are in the room, you just got to read it. That's a lot of what I've done. Um, I've never wanted to be the chef where people thought I was either too urban or, um, you know, looked like I was trying to be something that I wasn't. I am definitely authentic and true to myself. However, it's just honestly reading the room with whatever brand or company that I'm dealing with um, and making sure I just don't go too far. Like, I don't push the envelope a little bit too far, but I'm still staying true to myself. Yeah, that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> I think also the more spaces like this and all the smoke and things that are going against, at least in the media space, obviously with, yeah. you know, cooks and chefs, it's different. There's less of a pressure to conform because you know you can go elsewhere. So back in the day, it was the big conglomerates and there were only, you know, the big three of media and things like that. And if you didn't do things a certain way, there was never a door for you to enter. But, so you had to conform. But now the landscape's changed, it's different. So if you don't wanna go ahead and be somebody that you're not on network television or, or in a kitchen or wherever, there's a space for you elsewhere or you're in the position now with all the things that are accessible to create your own lane. Yeah, um, and is what you just said last, creating your own lane. Because when I started out, I've been doing this for 16 years. So when I started out, there wasn't a lane for what I'm doing. Like, I do not wear a chef coat. I refuse to wear it. It's not, it's not like I have anything against it, but I had one event where I was wearing a chef coat and someone looked down at me like I was a help and I almost, like, chopped their neck off. Mm. Because I'm enhancing your event. Honestly, people won't even remember your if it wasn't for my food. <laughs> so I'm just <laughs> being really honest. Right, right. <laughs> so um, since then, it was like, all right, let me just approach it to where I am just 1,000% being myself. Yeah. I'm showing you my art. Um, it's definitely a conversation piece among your guests. And <laughs> I pretty much did that from the gate. And my first publication was actually Hip Hop Weekly. And Benzino was like, nah, f the chef coat. Like, just do you. And I wore a bodysuit. <laughs> I yeah, wore a bodysuit. I love the bodysuit. Yeah. Do you have a bodysuit on now? It's yeah, not a bodysuit. No, suit. no it's, yeah, it's, it's it, was, it was like one of those Beyonce type bodysuits. And, and I just got on there with some heels and shit, And I just was myself. Is it true that you cook for Oprah Winfrey? Yes, I cook for Oprah Winfrey. I really do believe your first impressions really matter. And also treating everyone with respect also is a big thing because someone called me out of the blue and it was like, you remember, I, I told you you remind me of Oprah or whatever. She's like, well, she's doing, she's doing the Life You Want tour at American Airlines Arena. 
do you want to cook for it? I was like, yeah. I already was booked. I paid another chef to take it and then like also gave them some money back. And I cooked for Oprah. And she honestly told me some things that I will just never forget. And that's to live my life for myself. Don't worry about what other people think. Um, Cause I was at a age and step in my life where I was around people who were only around me because of what I had and the access that I had. And I don't know if she felt that in my energy, but when she honestly told me to just like really live for me and, and do what I had to do for myself, I cut a lot of people off. She went in a little bit more. It was like God was speaking through her to me because I was really depressive. And um, not to get super deep, but I was suicidal as well. So a couple of days before I got that call for the Life You Want tour, I almost shot myself. Wow. Yeah. I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people don't know that about me, but it was, it was really hard times. And it wasn't that I was suffering financially. I had a lot of things and I was doing a lot of things. The life was really fast and I saw a lot of stuff and um, it was just balancing it all, so. Wow, I mean, I feel like we can't just, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. I didn't even know that part of your story. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing. No problem. How are you now? I am really great. I'm really great. Like when I say like, before I used to hold on to people, now I just, cut them off. If, if, if you're not within my frequency, I cut you off. I know like I'm a God's gift to this planet. I do everyone good. I believe in karma. You know, I live my life knowing that when I go to sleep, I'm okay. Like I always try to add more to people's lives than, than anything else. So truthfully, if you give me any type of inkling that you are trying to do me harm or you're not here for me authentically, without you trying to use me you gotta go right yeah and i'm okay with that wow. i'm okay with that <laughs> thank you so much now you got me tearing up and they, <laughs> they they jack was trying to get me to tear up a little bit earlier yeah he's tearing the, can we yeah, zoom in yeah, i know i know i know that's his cry quota for the year I know. No, right but i ain't gonna really, let it out people don't really understand how <laughs> chefs actually do deal with depression a lot Right. That's thank you. Well, thank you for yeah. sharing with us. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Stay right here because we're going to shift the conversation, but we got to go back because I felt like I interrupted. Yeah, we, we definitely have to go back because I want to touch upon something else that DeJounte Murray said in the conversation, and it, it coincides with a quote you gave about a particular player. And this is not a direct quote, but you said that Tony Parker, Hall of Famer, I mean, I think we, we, can, all, we, create, we can all agree with that, but he's selfish. And that ties to a story pack. I don't know if you heard it, but DeJounte spoke about how when he eventually he got that starting position ahead of Tony Parker, he was called into the office and the decision was made. And although Parker put on a good poker face, he ended up leaving into Charlotte instead of staying and mentoring um, DeJounte and, 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 you know, helping him become, you know, acclimated as a new face of this San Antonio Spurs organization. So I want to ask you guys again, because I've never been in a locker room you know, as a player, does that happen a lot that vets take it personal once the young guy finally gets their spot and they're like, you're not my problem, I'm not gonna touch it, figure it out yourself? No, um, because I've been in that situation and no, it doesn't happen. It only happens to selfish people like Tony Parker. Perfect example, when I got there, I told you I played in San Antonio, mm -hmm. Steve Smith was starting. Um, 20 games to the season, I'm coming off the bench, but I'm averaging like 18 off the bench. So I end up starting in Seattle, right? Steve, is, that's my, like, my big brother at the time. He's a vet. Um, he's taking me to church with his family. Sunday dinner, I'm eating with him. After practice, he's taking me all these places. So when I get to the game, I'm kind of like shying away from him because I'm like, I don't really want to, I know him, I speak to everybody, but this is my OG. Like I'm taking his spot, you know what I'm saying? Like I don't really, I don't want him to make it seem like it's personal. Right, which is not, but in my mind, you know, I'm a young fella. I just don't want to. So as I'm walking in the locker room, he stopped me. Mm -hmm. He's like, young fella, what's up? Gave me a hug. Like, this ain't personal between me and you. I'm happy for you. Just like you was rooting me on. So no, it don't happen. Because it's a lot of vets in the league that want to see the young guys come up because they know they, they, they time is, is passing, right? And Tony should have been that same person, but he's not from here. 
Do you think that has something to do with it? It has a lot to do with it because he didn't grow up like we grew up, so that's why he grew up so selfish. Tony was told at 16, 17 years old that he was the best thing to slice bread in France. Mm -hmm. And he was in France. But we know a million Tony Parkers that's just like Tony that won't make it to the NBA here, right? And I knew the person he was, and, De and DeJounte was exactly right. Tony was the selfish person. And now that I'm saying this, people are looking at his documentary that he did when he's even admitting he was selfish. Right. He even admitted on his documentary a couple times how selfish he was being. Yeah. But the reason why he was able to get to go to Charlotte and not Ginobili or uh, T T uh, Tim Duncan, I'm giving y'all some game here. Tony was the only one that was in the newspapers for with the Gloria, with the, with the uh, TV chick he married. Mm. Uh, all that went south. Mm. They say he had sex with uh, Drew Barry's teammate. All that was in the media. <laughs> You never heard that about, you never heard Ginobili been in the papers. Mm -hmm. You never heard about Tim Duncan being in the papers. If anything was Tim Duncan, it was his wife or somebody else. It wasn't Tim, yeah. right? So Tony was the only one that did that. So he was a part of that big three. So when all that was happening and you, your game has been limited since you came in the league, Pop had enough. So he's like, you know what? I ain't got to get rid of Tim and Ginobili because they ain't doing nothing. But Tony, you forcing my hand. Wow. That's, see, that's some inside stuff that y'all didn't know. That, that was deep in saying that, like, so... The new era now and what how y'all did stuff back then. Um, do the do the owners and the coaches still have the power or do the players have the power now? Have it shifted or do you think it's the same way? Well, I, the owners ultimately have the power, right? In the in the grand scheme of things. But Well not but, the owner, I'm saying the coach, because for instance, um it just seemed like LeBron called the shots, like, hey, get his ass up out of here. Or AI, I don't want to fucking play for him. Or me, I want a new special team coach or get me the fuck up out of here. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is, you, you explain all the stuff that you went through during the old era. Right. Now that this new era where we got a voice as athletes, mm -hmm. do you think them same, same scenarios Table still going on? No, um, I definitely think, perfect example, like Donovan Ham, players that's coaching, that played, get more respect than coaches that didn't play. I say that, but you're right. Players have way more of a voice than they've ever had, right? Because a lot of teams don't want to look like that team that's not with the black power, right? So, uh, so every organization going to stand on that side now, you know what I'm saying? Because that's the thing. If, if you look like you're standing against what's right, you're going to be on that side that you can't come back from. So everybody's trying to jump ahead of the game, right? But why y'all wasn't doing this before all this George Floyd? Why y'all didn't care about yeah. black people before all this, right? Perfect example with ESPN with Rachel Nichols. You try to give Rachel a job and then take it from her and give it to, um, um, uh, Maria what's her name? Maria Taylor. Give it to Maria Taylor, but not telling the world that you're only giving it to her because y'all don't want to look racist. <laughs> but ESPN, you've been looking racist for the last 20 years, but you want to make Rachel be your fall guy after she gave you 20 years of her hard work? It don't work like that. So that's why we exploited the ass. You, you, you can't. Say that you for what's right with a text right. or a DM. You got to come show your face. You got you to be present. And that's what a lot of companies been doing for a long time. So, Just saying it so but not being physically present. Do you feel like y'all were the first all to smoke? Is that an opportunity when we talk about new media, right? Where is that an opportunity for the all to smokes of the world and, you know, all these other platforms, the drink champs and what's... Um, million dollar worth of games, you know what I mean, to really get it right. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because we stand on what we stand on. Right. You understand? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we work with linear networks? Because there's a place for them, mm -hmm. but also stay true to who we are. We don't need them because we have to be authentic in our true selves, right? We controlling our own narrative. When have we had that? Never. If I would have had a show like this, perfect example. The brawl happened to, to, yesterday. If I can call, if I had an opportunity where I could call both of y'all, be like, look, man, I want to come tell what happened and not just have to sit and let the media tell my story for 20 years right. and have me lose money and be, be labeled as an asshole and a thug because the media told the story when I couldn't tell it. But now everybody looking at it different that we did the thing with Netflix to mm -hmm. tell our story. Oh, damn, they did y'all bad. But we couldn't say nothing for 20 years because at that time, the NBA was trying to clean up the image. So the, the best thing for them to do is continue to make us look bad. But now we controlling our own narrative. Now people looking at me and Matt is in a different light. Now people looking at y'all and you pack in a different light now because the committee is not controlling 
who you are. You control your own narrative now. Mm. That's why because it's room for everybody in every podcast space. I've never, right. I've never had a chance to say anything about any court thing that I've ever been in while I play football. You've really? never, you can't even find a fucking, a statement from me. You know what? Every time I've gotten some, even if I'm fucking wrong or right, shh, the first thing the fucking lawyer say is, shh, don't shh, speak. Yeah. Don't say nothing. If we'd have had this shit right here, I'm saying we seen motherfuckers get fouled out of a game. Motherfuckers go straight to the podcast. Hey, <laughs> yeah, straight yeah. up, get kicked oh, out. Of game. No, 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 no. But it gives clarity though. Yes. It gives a lot and, of clarity and, to and, the situation. And, and it clears up all of the bullshit. Yes, sir. Because it's easy for ESPN to say, "Oh yeah, he was at a strip club. He was shooting Pac-Man Jones. That well, this motherfucker strip club that had 20 shoots." Yeah. Yeah, because I was them don't mean that I started the goddamn shoot. <laughs> right, right. Guess what? Once or twice, boom, then it becomes a clip where, oh, we know how to get his ass. We gonna basically try to blackball him I'm without blackballing him. Before we move on, talking about relationships, going back to the conversation about veteran leadership for, for young guys in the locker room, for rookies in the locker room, all three of you have been a rookie at some point. Yeah. And I think that with DeJounte saying like, hey, I would have really liked if Tony stayed, goes against the narrative that I think has been pushed constantly that these young guys don't want to learn from those before him mm. or they, before them or they think that they're better. So mm. I want to ask all of you as guys who have been rookie at, rookies at some point in your career, does that, for lack of a better phrase, hurt your feelings at all? When you look up to somebody and you're in that locker room with them and you want to be great and you want to have the kind of career, if not better than the person you're speaking to, and they're just like, you're not my problem. I'm sorry. I'm I was, gonna... See, this I, is why we need to different. add you to the show. You got such <laughs> great questions. Uh, the, great so question. what does that do for you? I was a little different. I was a first round pick, but I've never looked up to no other man. <laughs> I'm sorry, like not as far as my craft, like I, well, Deion Sanders, but as far as in the locker room, and maybe maybe mine was different, you know. I come from a different background. I've been raising myself since I was 12 years old. Football, like, once I got to the league, like, I was like, why would I look at somebody else? And I done did all this hard work to get here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, I would take different stuff and, and steal it from people. But I've never had, I've never. But what if it were Dion? And as somebody who, you know, you say you, you not idolized, but you looked up to Dion. You know, you respected his his craft, his his career, his athleticism. What if you had gone to Dion, whether it was just for something as simple as advice, and he said, not my problem. Like, what does that feel like? But that's different than playing on the team. You get what I'm saying? It's different than me calling D, hey, hey, Jack, give me some advice on this, boom, 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 boom. And I don't call him about a couple business deals, but like, when it far as playing, I don't, first of all, I wouldn't, if, if, if I would have got drafted by a team that Deion Sanders was, was at, I would have told him I wasn't going. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to go play. Right. I don't want to sit behind nobody. Maybe it's different for me because it's football. So you want to go and play behind T.O.? Yes. Oh, that's, I'm so glad you said Bruh, that because you know you, me and T.O. be beefing. Is. You know me and T.O. be beefing. Let me tell you. Every year when I was, the first three years, four years, when I got uh, drafted to the Denver Broncos, I kept going up to Coach Shanahan, Mike Shanahan, the older, the, the OG. And I'm like, please go get T.O. I wanted to learn from him. Remember when he was going through that situation with uh, going to Philly? Mm -hmm. When you were doing the push-up. I was like, can we please go get him? Because I knew if he was there, you know what I'm saying, it was going to make me better. And also, my coach, DJ McCarthy, who's sitting here right now, we had this dynamic in our locker room in college where we, like, share everything. You know, Mike Sims Walker was on the other side. And me and Mike would just bounce off each other. Bro, you got 100. I'm at 50. I want you to get to 100. You know where the ball is going, so go take my spot. Right? So I had a different mindset when I got in the league. It wasn't until I got in the league and Javon Walker, and I say this, I love Javon, but Javon was selfish. Just like you say, Tony, Tony Perker was selfish. Javon Walker showed me what selfish looked like. I didn't know what that was. I went to him before the season started, and I said, hey, hey, Jay Walk, like, you just got 50 million. Boom. I'm the ex. If you ever want to take my position because you know the ball coming here, you can take it. That's what we did in college. Javon was like, I want everything. Right? And when he went down, I had 100 catches. It changed my, my, my mindset. So, like, I wanted T.O. to come. I wanted uh, Derek Mason to come. I wanted to learn from them. 
So, so what does that do then when a rookie goes to a vet, whether NFL or NBA locker room, and they're not embraced as like the next wave, you know, the net, the future of that franchise of that organization, does it does it affect them at all, or do a lot of guys just th just know that that's what comes with it? It, it, it can go two ways. Uh, some guys, some guys, and older guys embrace it because they're teaching some of the young guys how to be professionals. I think that was the hardest part for me. Basketball was easy, but I'm. This is a business now. I got to be a professional. This is a job now. That's one thing. Two, um, when the older guy doesn't embrace the young guy, this what could happen. The younger guy can end up resenting him. Mm. If the younger guy is an up and coming star, that older mm -hmm. guy gonna be gone soon. That's right. If that older guy is gonna be there a couple more years, that younger guy. So it it it's, it's gonna cause some type of friction where somebody's gonna be gone. In basketball, that doesn't stay long. They break that up quick. And, 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 and for me, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about like manhood, mental health and all of that. Like I knew who I was. Like even when I talk to my sons and my nephews right now, like I preach them like, yo, you got to know who you are because when you know who you are, then you can create boundaries and those boundaries teach people how to treat you. You understand? Right. So for me, like I stepping in, I knew like I got born a star, die a star on my side, and I did that in college because I knew, like, I'm a star regardless of the situation. Javon Walker, T.O., no, Ocho Cinco, I don't care who I'm playing against. I know what God got for me, I'm going to have it. Right. You know understand? So, like, there's so much to this conversation. Phenomenal question. When you think about, you know, you, bro, you know, like, the theme, every episode will have a theme. We think about you as, like, new new media, new era, athlete. Like, you know, we want to talk to you about so much, you know, because like, I truly believe you are the voice of the athlete. I feel like a lot of us are institutionalized where we don't feel like we can be real, mm -hmm. unapologetic, wear that, what you call it, a body, what you a say? A body suit. A body suit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you were one of the first, like you like soldier boy in the chef space. No, 1000% and I own that. <laughs> right, like, you know what I'm saying? And that's uncomfortable a lot of times. You, you, all of that. As you guys know, like, we love talking about health and wellness and, and, and I want to bring you in here, Zach, right? Like. You know, we'll do a lot of this, right? Like when I think of I am athlete, I think about business, entertainment, media, and sports. Athletes could be so many different shapes and sizes and we have different interests. So now we talking about the B, the business side of things, right? And for us, we like wellness. I wanna shift the conversation to better sex. That's the topic for me. Theme for you, boom, new. Now you better sex. Like, y'all laughing, and I'm glad that we now have Chef Danny and also Ashley Nicole Moss here, yeah, right? I'm, because I'm we need to have this conversation. We don't like to have some of these conversations. I want this platform to be a platform where people come in, and it doesn't matter if they like basketball or football or freaking broadcasting, <laughs> chefery. Food. That, that's I a like word. basketball and football, too. <laughs> and catch out of it. So the theme right now that we're shifting to is better sex. How do we have better sex? Zach, the CEO, founder of Roe, company Roe, like legendary. I would love to give like a little bit of background about Roe. Um, happy to share sort of how we got started. And then we could talk about, we could talk about sex as much as you'd like. Let's um, do it. So yeah, very simply, uh, Roe helps patients achieve their health goals in the most effective and convenient way. Um, but the big difference is patients come to us and t they tell us what they want to achieve. So they come and say, I want to lose weight. And we have comprehensive weight loss programs, or I want to have a child. And we have fertility products and services. Or I want to have better sex. I want to improve my mental health. I want to improve my skin. And the way that we're able to do that in a really convenient and effective way is that we've seamlessly integrated a doctor's office, labs, and pharmacy. All seamlessly connected, but through the lens of a patient's goal. Mm. How we ended up on better sex is... Roe actually started with erectile dysfunction. And the reason we started there was actually was something that um, I experienced. It was a side effect of my heart medication. And I was very, very lucky that I grew up with a dad who was a physician. And if you think about that concept, which we, we refer to as goal-oriented healthcare, right? Um, it's actually what uh, the richest people in the world have access to, right? They walk into a room, there's eight doctors, and they might walk in here and there's a bunch of, there's all the products and services that they need. 
They say what they want to achieve, and then the entire system is structured to help them do that. So what we did is we did the same exact thing where someone comes to us, again, they say, this is what I want, and then we connect doctors, labs, and pharmacies all seamlessly and to, all through the lens of helping them achieve that goal. Some, some people come to us and they say, well, no, well they want to have better sex. Right. And the question is, well, um, it's different for every individual, but a few of the products that we help uh, or that we have that help them do that is treatment for erectile dysfunction, treatment for premature ejaculation. Maybe, it's, maybe they have low testosterone. Um, we just launched, which uh, we talked about a little bit, which would love to talk about, um, we just launched this brand new obesity program, uh, which is a comprehensive weight loss program, uh, really centered around these new medications called GLP-1s uh, to help patients lose 15% of their body weight. There's this conversation that we're uncomfortable having mm -hmm. between men and women. You have women that's having a conversation. I don't know if men are having a conversation, but I definitely know we're not having it together. Yeah. And it's a real thing. So like, all of your research, all your work, like, what have you seen in this space as far as, like, how can we take this from a taboo topic to an everyday conversation that feels comfortable when it comes to better sex? Yeah. Because that's a big thing. If I'm dating someone, and if I don't have good sex from the beginning, that could determine a win or a loss. Definitely. No question. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> right? Uh, Am I right, uh, though? Uh, Period. Period. <laughs> right? Period. Not, Period. Even, not even trying a second time, bro. <laughs> like, so, no, you. before we even get to you, let me ask you, like, what, what, like, how, let's ask that question. How important is sex in a relationship? Uh, for me, it's the top. It's, it's honestly at, at the top. Like it's, one? <laughs> or like Shit, top mine, five? mine might be at <laughs> the top like, of the top. Hey, that it's it's my love zero, language yeah. is That's physical. Like my top love language is physical touch, and then is is like uh, quality time is second. So like that's a part of sex, physical touch. So one. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely up there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's big it's, in my it's household. It's there. It's a big part yeah. of my household. It's big in your household. Yeah, yeah. The, man. Well, I, I mean, obviously, it's you like you said, it's not just about you guys don't have products just geared towards sex. Yep. You know, obesity is something that you guys are also interested in tackling. And you said something interesting, some numbers when I was talking to you off camera regarding it. Kind of share that with everybody here and how obesity is directly related to sex. Pax, this is interesting. Listen to this. Obesity is probably the most common chronic health condition th that the globe faces definitely in, in America. 76 San Antonio. Yeah. <laughs> So that's only one of the leading cities, I don't mean to cut you off, they one of the no. leading cities dealing with obesity. Yeah. And it's yeah. 76. When said that about San Antonio, it's, it's was factual. it factual? Yes, it's factual. Well, I've lived I guess there. We all, all they do is an eat. Apology. Yeah, all they do is eat. Yeah, it's 76% 76, 76 of the U.S. population either has obesity or, or has overweight. And one of the reasons we're so excited at Roe is because there's this new treatment um, that we think is going to, and we're not alone in that, is going to revolutionize treatment for obesity. So it's, you might have heard of uh, semaloglutide or a Zempic potentially in the news or Wegovy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a once a week injection and it's uh, the drug class is called GLP-1s, but it does three really interesting things to treat obesity. Um, the first is it regulates your sugar levels. The second is that it uh, impacts your appetite. And the third is that it slows the passage of food from your stomach to your small intestine. And the data is tremendous where, depending on the drug, and there's different types, but people are losing between 15 and 20% of their body weight over the course of a year. Wow. Um, and so historically, we've really only had two effective treatments for weight loss. Um, they've been surgery, bariatric surgery, and pharmaceutical treatments. And the, one of the problems with surgery is that it's very expensive, it's inaccessible, and we have only done about 200,000 every year, right, um, the past couple of years. So it's, it's not a scalable solution. The really exciting things about these new treatments is that you can actually help, you can help really scale and solve the, the treatment of obesity. Um, so now it, it causes, it's when you can take a weekly injection, and we talked a little bit about this, but I think one of the greatest misunderstandings of obesity is that it is a disease. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a disease for the, for the people that are facing it. It needs high quality ongoing care. And one of the common misunderstandings even about, we talked about this a little bit too, about diet and exercise, is diet and exercise is phenomenal for your overall health. Um, it isn't linked statistically to significant and durable weight loss. 
right? So this entire time everyone's been told for decades, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise in order to lose weight. Um, and it, it, we've attached, um, and we, we mentioned it a little bit in San Antonio, it, we've attached, you know, they, they eat all the time. You, we've attached, I'm not saying you did this at all, but this is what society does. It's someone having overweight or having obesity has, is a moral issue, right? Where we think that it is in some way related to a lack of their self-control. And it couldn't be further from the truth. It's a biological, it's, it's a, it, they have a different biological process that's occurring. Right. And this medication is what helps them through that. And happy to dive into more detail there. But um, one of the most important conversations that we need to have when it comes to obesity is the separation between the prevention of obesity and the treatment of obesity. We talk a lot about at Road that you need data to move the brain, you need a story to move the heart, and you need both to move a person. And I'd say like people, even when I was talking about it, right, and I was talking about statistics and I was telling about the stories about the underlying science or the data, you know, average weight loss or whatever it may be. And that helps move people's brain, but it's not enough to move an entire person. And I think having, even I was just sitting here being moved by your conversation, um, having y'all here and be people that everyone looks up to and yes you see 30 million people experience erectile dysfunction or you know 100 million people have overweight or have obesity it's not enough to move that person they need people that they look up to like mm -hmm. like you guys right showing that the, uh, the single individual the story that they can actually associate with to move their heart and right. it's a combination of the two that moves them you talking about mental health um, you're talking about your, your, your family and all of those different things. So I just have to say, like, I was unexpectedly, like, deeply moved sitting, sitting there waiting. And um, it's really special what you guys are doing. No, I appreciate Thanks, that. Bro. And uh, please come back. We're going to hit you up. And we're going to continue these conversations. You know, talk about mental health. Talk about financial literacy. Talk about relationships. Talk about better sex. Talk about obesity. All those things. Call us on Tuesdays. Yep. Paper route, I am athlete tonight. Thanks, Doc, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks, uh, Doc. So anybody out there that may have been moved from this conversation, um, you can learn more information and find out more about the products at row.co, C-O. So row.co slash athlete. It rhymes. It rhymes. It does rhyme. Row.co slash athlete. Athlete. <laughs> I, I got to get that. I want a copy of that. That's great. One of the things that I think is cool is every time you post about something that is difficult in our community, you always put up the fist sign, but all colors, mm -hmm. right? Um, you stand on what you stand on and what you believe, you know, so how do you, you know, push the conversation forward when it comes to the black story and a black experience, but also, you know, make sure that it's inclusive and everybody feel good about it. Well, it's that simple too. I know how to be black and proud without demeaning another race. I don't need to demean someone to make myself look better. Right. Right? That's the, that's the weakest form of a, of, a, of a man, to feel like you have to demean somebody to make yourself look good. Right? I put up all fists because I've told somebody from every race that I love them and mean it. And it's been reciprocated. And I know you wouldn't know about me if it wasn't for a, a white Jewish kid that drove from Houston to, to my ghetto when I was 15 to give me a chance to play on this AAU team, to be seen, to be an All-American, to be a top player in the country. So it's, it's somebody from every race that's had an important, or is important in my life to somewhat. So it's easy for me to love everybody, right? So anybody that has to demean somebody to make themselves look better, they dying inside. They really don't like what they look at. Right. So that's why I can say, I can put uh, the, 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 the color of every emoji because I stand behind something that I patent called love for all who have love for all, mm. right? I love everybody who loves everybody. Right. But if you have any hate in your bone for any type of race, then I'm not the person for you, right? I'm not the person for you at all because we can't relate. I love everybody and I've, and, and I've, I've always stood that way because somebody from every race has had an important a part of my life to get me where I'm at right now. Right. So you've led the conversation, and sorry, Ashley, I know there's so many things we want to talk about. I promise to be my last com my last question on this. But, bro, like, you know, we all know what George Floyd meant to you, um, his family, his daughter, what you have done for their family, what you have done for him. Um, 
in 2020, racial tension is soaring at an all-time high, and you were on the f- forefront of that. You know, literally, bro, in the middle of a pandemic, like, lead in a way with a lot of emotion, a lot of passion, a lot of purpose, and a lot of intentionality, right? So I just asked this question, and, you know, we can take it wherever we want to go, but, you know, from that moment to today, what has changed, and how do you feel about it? A lot has changed, but nothing has changed. We're still getting killed by police. We, we're still getting treated like we're lesser than. Right, so the whole the whole thing, even with Georgia getting killed, yeah, my whole thing was to get him get justice, because we've seen so many people of our color get killed get, get killed by the police and they don't get justice. We also seen that every time somebody get killed by the police, the first thing they do is bring up every bad thing they've done from since they was a baby to now to try to demean their character so they can make it, the killing that they did make it look worthy, like the guy deserved deserved it, which is all bull. Right? Everybody has made mistakes in their past. But with Georgie, one thing that was different with him, out of all the people that have been murdered by the police, none of them had a professional basketball player that had one of the biggest podcasts in the country that everybody knew was the NBA champion. See, that's what they f***ed up at. And they didn't know that I was going to ride for him and put everything on the line for him the same way he would have done for me. But see, it wasn't no playbook to it, Pac. It ain't no playbook to seeing your friend die on TV, somebody who you look just like, who, you, who, who the only person on, you, on the earth that you call twin see him get murdered and wake up with your daughter and getting text from your wife's mother telling you see what they did your twin. Like, you, you can't, there's no playbook to none of this stuff. So I didn't know what I was doing, Pac. Yeah. I was just leaving with my chest, head up, chest out. I didn't know, I've never seen, that shit was a movie to me. To seeing people protesting, throwing stuff at the police, uh, looting and all, like, I, this shit was a movie to me. So I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, but one thing I did know, I was putting, I was risking everything. My job, friendships, everything, because nobody wanted, nobody of, 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 of an NBA champion has stood in the camera worldwide to try to put a police in jail. It's never been done, right? And I didn't know I was going to be the face of the biggest civil rights movement ever. Mm. Let me say that again, and I'm proud to say that Activists. because, you know what I'm saying? Because I never would have thought that, Pac, right. you know where I come from? I never would have thought that one day I would say that I'm, out of all the stuff that we learned from Malcolm X and Martin King, that I would be the face of the biggest civil rights rights movement ever. 18 countries, 50 states, all protested at the same time, and it's never been done. All because they they was able to see Georgie get murdered. And everybody felt that pain, right? So I was just being the face for him. You know, I knew how much he loved his daughter. We have daughters the same age. I didn't know his family. I'm a real one. What I look like going jump in front of his family when all is going on to try to be seen and try to be the voice of the family, I don't know them. Yeah. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I, I, and, and let me let me tell you, let me, disingenuous. And let me tell you how honest I was with it. After the trial, his nephew that was speaking up, his name was Wu. He was he was speaking up the whole time. He pulled me to the side. He was like, "Bro, this is why I love you. I DM'd you the day it happened. You never respond." I say, "Bro, because I knew I was gonna talk to you, but I didn't want to come get in front of them cameras and speak for the family when I didn't know none of them. That's fake." That's me preying on other people's pain, what so many people do. When something happens to somebody, people run down there and try to, how can I benefit off this person's pain? That wasn't me, because I genuinely loved him, but I knew what his daughter meant. And when, around that time, this is all true stories, Gianna and her mother was getting represented by uh, Crump and the whole family, they was all together. But this is what made her call me. This is my first time saying this. She called me while she was sitting at a press conference. And one of the representatives came told her, we want you to just be cool for a second. We're going to take care of the family, but it's really about the golden child. That's what they saying to, the, to her and her daughter. Why they, why we, our, our friends just got murdered. So that's letting me know, they, they, the last thing they care about is, the, is, is these people pain. Mm-hmm. They're trying to see how they can benefit off of it. Because they know if you throw the daughter out there, then everybody going to jump, you know what I'm saying? So she called me instantly because she saw the fake shit, a real one. Yeah. Her, and Georgie, her and Georgie slept in the car together for years. Hmm. For years, bro. So this is the closest person to him. But, but she is street smart. She got sense. You can't, you know what I'm saying? She real smart. She hood, but she super smart. Yeah. And she saw that in the jump. So she called me. She's like, Steve, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know I got to take care of Gianna. And I don't feel like this is the place where we're going to be represented right. So the first thing I did was ask my wife. First thing I did was jumped up and went to Minnesota. I said, first thing I do, I don't know what I'm doing. I said on Instagram. Yeah, I was crying on Instagram. I said, I don't know what I'm doing, 
but I'm headed down there, bro. And I knew from all my relationships that I could start getting favors from Gianna because I knew her mama didn't know how to dress. She never been in front of a camera, all this stuff. So we had to, you know what I'm saying? We had to coach her and make sure Gianna was comfortable doing this whole time because this is a seven year old girl yeah. seeing all this shit on TV about her daddy, right? right? That's disturbing. And, and, and they're showing him getting killed on TV constantly, constantly, constantly. So this is stuff that we have to deal with, but also keep her in a good space where she still, a big, still could be a child. Right. So, so look, when I opened up the show, when I introduced Pac, I said, real, you know, realer and realist. I called you a disruptor. Uh, question I have for you is, is this the realest you've ever done, bro? Not even close. And you know what's crazy to say? I'm more known now for me standing up for Georgia than anything I've done basketball-wise at podcast, anything. Right. And, and I, I appreciate that because I did something for somebody else that I didn't benefit from. Mm. Right? But, but, but is this the realest thing you've ever done? Because like I, I think about like, because when, you know, like it, when I when I sit selfless. down even when right. when I sat on y'all show y'all asked me about the mental health stuff that's yeah. one of the things that people ask me every time I sit on the show they want to ask me about mental health and one of the com one of the questions that always comes up is like yo in 2011 did you think about like what you were doing right because I didn't think about like when I said what was going on that there were the stigma around it I just f***ing laid with my head up and my are. chest like. Yes. Like, I need to tell this story. But now looking back, bro, I'd be like, damn, why did I say that? Or if I knew what I was up against, would I have done something differently? So I'm asking you this because do you ever look back and be like, man, I went through some Because you went through some Bro, you never know when you're going to be a vessel. Mm. And that's what we all aiming to be, a vessel, bro. That's what we all aiming to be. You, you didn't know. No, not everybody's aiming to be a vessel. You need to tell everybody why they're here. You need to educate. Yeah. Let everybody you, it, know they're here to be a vessel, a vessel and make the world better. But you know so what? So sorry. Everybody, everybody don't think like that. Everybody either. don't think like that. You're right. Everybody don't, because you're doing this. When you do like stuff like this, I use myself as an example. When I got the boys, Chris Henry boys, I never thought about all of that during the process. My whole thing was, yeah, I got to do this. I got to make sure that these motherfuckers get to skip the line because Wally would have wanted me to do this. Right. He would have did this for my kids. Right. You get what I'm saying? So I never really sit back and like, oh, shit. you know, shit. It was a, it was a no brainer. Like, this is what I, I'm, this is my calling. You, does that make, make sense? It makes sense. 100 percent. And I'm, uh, bro, and when I say activist, um, like I said, we've been on each other for a long time. But mm -hmm. when that happened, then after that, I had, I don't know if you if they reached out to you, but I had the the, the kid who got killed in Georgia. Um, reach hey, any way that we can get in in contact Ahmaud. with, Ahmaud. yeah, Ahmad, you know. Oh, um, yeah. But like you've set the 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 pedestal of just being one hundred, like to a certain Going level, the right way. Yeah, yeah. man, yeah. and like it's hard for us. Like it's so fucked up, but these cameras don't lie. These cameras. Not at all. Now we 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 starting to kind of catch their ass. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Been killed. They've been killing us the whole time, but we ain't have cameras. We ain't have body cam. But see, like, and a lot of people too, Pac, like, a lot of people don't even understand. It's a whole lot that went on through that whole situation that they still ain't talking about. Like, why was it sheriffs in the back of the ambulance when they picking up Georgie? Whenever you seen sheriffs hop out of ambulance when they pull up to a scene? It's EMS workers. It's mm -hmm. never sheriffs. Why is it three sheriffs hopping out? They didn't talk about that. So it's, it's a lot of stuff, Why, bro. Why, though? What's that? I don't know. Bro, it's a lot of stuff that we don't have control over that they know what they doing, right? <laughs> and the only reason why it w a lot of stuff that we were able to get justice for because it was on camera. Yeah. But it's a lot of stuff that was done, you know what I'm saying? Like, even now, they trying they trying to find ways to get him out of jail. They trying to get him to, uh, he said he had an unfair, they doing all kind of stuff like that that we knew was going to happen, bro. You know what I'm saying? But this is a part of the game. This is a part of the game they play. They put us in these positions on purpose, bro. Right? The, I tell people this all the time. People try to make it seem like, let me clear up two, one thing, too. The whole time doing the George said people was like, he deserved it. He put a gun to a woman's stomach. I'm, we really from it. I'm going to tell you what really happened. He took the case from somebody. So this is what happens in the hood. If you're not from the hood, this is what happens. If you got a friend, say, I, say me and you got in, the, in, the, in the trouble. I got a charge. But it makes more sense 
for me to put that charge right. on my charge. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, 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 it makes sense for us to get less of time if, right. I, if I just add it on the mind. It ain't, it ain't really holding no weight. I got a heavy charge on me already. So let me just put this charge on mine because it's going to help my brother out. Right. That's what he did. He didn't put no gun in no woman's stomach. This is stuff that people don't know, right? And they're on the outside looking in. But the difference between me and Georgie, and y'all should know this if you're from, our, from uh, our areas, the difference between you and a lot of guys, the best ath athletes are in jail. Yeah, but the difference between us and them. Never seen the best athletes. The, the difference between us and them is what? Somebody saved you. Opportunity. Yes. Yeah. Opportunity. Yes. Me and Georgie lived 45 minutes. We did the same thing, sold drugs, hung around, did the same, hang around the same people. He was an athlete, but different opportunity. He didn't have that Jewish kid to drive to him. Mm. And mm -hmm. when he was in the hood, say, man, I got an opportunity for you to come play. He didn't have that. But we are the same person. And that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's what a lot of people in our areas deal with. We all have the talent. We all have the brains and the wit to do whatever. It's the, we don't get the opportunities. So, Stephon so Marbury you... talks about that in his documentary. You know, he comes from a, a family. His brothers all play ball. But it was him who was the last chance for the Marbury name to go pro. Mm -hmm. And he says that in Coney Island, he was always protected. He, he was always safe to go ahead and pursue just basketball because nobody else would allow anything else to touch him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge difference, too, is that you can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't have the protection, especially in communities where you need it, that's that's everything. That's everything. That's everything that's on whether you make it or whether you not, right. whether you don't. That's right. Like, and, and, so, that's and so I love that you said that, man, because we don't talk about that a lot on these platforms. You know, the greatest athletes we've never seen. Orange Hill. There's the, yeah. the best basketball for MJ. It's not even close. Not right. even close. Not even close, dog. Deion Sanders, <laughs> Pac-Man Jones, please. It's 20, I, I, it's 20 I, I, of them in jail. Out of my right. whole projects, I'm, I probably wasn't even the top 10 best athlete in the projects. Right. It let me, so well, many. I, let, let me ask you this Raw, question. Too, just raw yeah. talent. Drug testing has always been part of professional sports, but I wonder if you feel, because I know for me, the underlining message doesn't sit well with me. For me, it sometimes feels like by drug testing somebody after such an incredible game, it's almost saying in so many words, you can't do that without help. Facts. Mm. And it makes me feel a certain type of way. So I wonder on the other side of that, as a player with God-given talent who can go out and do incredible things on a court, night in and night out, or on a field, what does that feel like when you get that call like, great game, I need you to come pee and come. <laughs> Right, right. Like, right. That's a good question. Like, what does that feel like? Two, two things. One, they're not getting tested for weed. So they, let me pat myself on the back, me and Matt. <laughs> Because they're not getting tested for weed no more. We had a lot to do with that. So they can care less about the drug right. test. Right. But one, the NBA be showing their hand. Because Luca had 60, 20, and 15, something like that. He didn't get drug tested. But the Donovan Mitchell is 71. He get drug tested. Mm -hmm. So they just showing their hand. They showing, they still showing how unfair it is. Right, it's right there in your face. Luca had a 60, 20, triple double. He didn't get drug tested. But Donovan my Mitchell. Mix at that. You know what I'm saying? But Donovan Mitchell have 71. So they just they just showing you how unfair it is. All you gotta do is open your eyes. They didn't, they didn't, this is not done by accident. All this is intentional. They know exactly what they're doing. I, I, before we move, God damn, man. I, this is a good thing that you're saying. When I get tested, I'll be like, Sh it balled out. Yeah, that's how yeah, I feel Sersky, too. You know what I mean? So you don't take it personal. <laughs> no, no, because I mean, normally yes they no. testing your yes ass no. after you have a good game. Like, right. oh, my had two picks, a long touchdown. Right. <laughs> we been there, but well, we balled out. God damn, they tested it. They got them. So when I first got in the league, when I was in Denver, we had all these. DJ Williams used to be on the show. He was the one passing around the uh, Vialysis. Cialis and the Cialis. That's different. Whatever dog. it's called. No, Cialis, no, Vialis, Vialis. But yeah, but oh, we, was doing, we wasn't doing Viagra. So fun. what happens is they was passing them out before the game. We was taking them because when you when it, it thins out your blood, thins out your blood, energy, and you go longer. I'm not talking about Cialis, and I'm talking about actual surgery. Oh, what you saying? Yeah, like like enlargement. Yeah, surgery. that's what I'm talking about. Enlargement. People be really People doing, be that. doing that. Yes. I ain't never. I ain't know no. I don't know no about that. <laughs> no, no. See, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah, hey, listen, listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all talking about what, something that's gonna keep you right for 36 hours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, now, yeah. Now it's my taking that. They can be that way forever. Oh my god. <laughs> In, yes. the, in the league? That's how you get suspended. That's how you get suspended. People do that in the NBA? 
People, I'm sure people do that six, across Y'all 6'7", 6'8", I thought like... What does that have to do with pause. anything? <laughs> Is that a pause? A pause. That's a major pause. <laughs> pause. I'm just saying. That's major. Oh I never God. heard that. Was, that was, that was he OD. said the shoe size and that, that size that are OD. not clicking. That ain't no OD. <laughs> Let's skip that ain't part no right there. You heard he said, I'm corny. I'm corny. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to the basketball. I'm secure in my manhood. <laughs> I mean, obviously. Hold on, surgery. time out. No, time out. I'm sorry. Don't have surgery. This is really happening right now? Yeah. Brandon. <laughs> like, what? Yes. Bro, let me, let me, let me tell you. <laughs> ain't, nobody, ain't nobody getting suspended for taking Cialis. But, but what's the problem? But, okay, let's say they doing that. What you say, they doing it. What's wrong with that? Why do they got to be suspended over that? If they feel like they need to be. be, be because. It has something in there. Yes. It has a steroid that in there. In Same it. way it's if you take a, a, oh, 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 okay, a okay, on a steroid. Okay, okay. It's so okay. different than in yeah. the NFL. I forget the player, but there was a player who was um, I can't trying, to, names. trying to conceive with yeah. his wife, and she was going through, I want to say, in vitro, and she was going through the, fertiliz the, the fertilization of her eggs, and he was on medication to, I think, increase his mm -hmm. testosterone. Mm -hmm. Wasn't doing it to increase his performance. It was to have a baby, okay. and he got suspended because the ingredient in there still comes right. up in a test. You remember so. what Eddie Murphy said on Golden Child? What he said? They say? tried to sell him that stuff to uh, help keep the yang up. What that boy <laughs> said? Ain't nothing wrong with my yang. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? Bro, I can't. Because it goes to the value thing, right? Like, are you thinking about that? Well, I think for me, well, the only thing I'm really working on next is Will Smith is uh, doing my life story, my documentary. Wow. I'm Westbrook. Is yeah. this breaking news? It's breaking news. Um, we, we talked about it on the, on the podcast when we had him on our show at the end of the show, but uh, Westbrook is doing my documentary, so I'm really locked into that because I have a lot, a lot that went on in my life that a lot of people don't know, you know what I'm saying, that I, that I really want to tell because I shouldn't be here, you know what I'm saying? I was a, a year or two from going in the draft and I go get nine ounces of hard cocaine out the house while the police in there for my homeboy. That's the type of thing I was doing. So, you know what I'm saying, I got a story to tell, you know what I'm saying? And, and I, can't nobody tell it better than me. Right. All the smoke, collabing with I Am Athlete, you know what I'm saying? It's important for athletes uh, to work together and understand the, the movement that we're in right now. Understand that, you know, new media is a real thing, you know, and protecting each other, riding for each other, and also holding each other accountable. That's a big part. You can't, you can't get sensitive when you have somebody who been there before and saying like, no, nah, this ain't the way. Mm -hmm. You had somebody do that for you. Mm -hmm. I had somebody do that for you. You had someone do that for you and Dion. And I'm sure there's women in sports and also other uh, men that's doing it for you when it comes to journalism and commentating and broadcasting, right? So we can get sensitive there, but this is an amazing conversation to start uh, season four, I Am Athlete. You know, don't forget to subscribe to I Am Athlete and also All The Smoke. You know, like, um, download, it's important. We gotta support each other so we can continue these conversations. This is a safe place. So I love that we had this, 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 this debate. We gotta bring back Matt Barnes. We gotta do something dope, bro. Maybe in March we coming we gotta out be there. We smoke a facility. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's why you gotta come see us. We're going to come to you. We're going to come to L.A. in March. Yeah. We're going to do a live show. Maybe we do yeah. something together or whatever. Round table with us. For round table. We need we, yeah. And we're going we gonna to continue to lead the way. But thank you guys for leading the way and, and opening the door appreciate for people it. like us. I am athlete. It. We'll see you guys next week, Monday, 12 Eastern. Smell me. Mm. <laughs> well, we had to fight to get a meal. Yeah, wrongfully accused. We had to fight to get a pill. That's why we right to get a deal. He on the team, he gotta eat, you know. Spike, spike your skills. Fat. Keep it riding for the fam. You gotta light the wooden wheel straight up. But in the past bad, work up in the trash bag. I'll pass a lot to take the test before I pass class. Yeah, and my family needed bread. I had to come correct. That's why I keep airing it out like I just passed.